Welcome back to the channel. We're going to be talking about something that I've been meaning to do a deep dive on. Mammography. Mammographic screening for healthy women. This isn't about women at elevated risk of breast cancer, people with hereditary BRCA mutations. This is about average risk women. This is about the new USPSTF guidelines, United States Preventive Services Task Force. This is about mammograms preventive. Do they save lives? And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. I've been studying this for about 10 or 15 years, published a number of papers on this topic. I'm going to walk you through my papers, other people's papers. I'm going to build the case for three themes. One, I don't think it saves lives. If save lives means living longer, there's no strong evidence that that's the case. We need to replicate the most basic randomized control trials in this space. We need to power those replicatory efforts for overall survival, not just breast cancer specific death. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. So what is the purpose of screening? <clears throat> the purpose of screening, of course, is to find cancer. The first thing you want to do is you want to find cancer. You can't have a screening test that doesn't find more cancer than you otherwise would. It would be ineffective from the get-go. So you got to find cancer. But that's not the end of the road. But that's the first step. Well, it turns out some interventions don't even find more cancer. For instance, a self-breast exam. We lack robust randomized evidence that you even find more cancer. Let me go ahead and show you the results from the Shanghai study. This is the Shanghai large randomized control trial of women in Shanghai instructed to do a self-breast exam or not, and it follows them for many years, as you can see, and it shows you absolutely no difference in deaths per 100,000, but not even a difference in invasive carcinoma shown in the table. Benign breast disease is found a lot more often from the self-breast exam, but we don't have a clear signal that you even find more cancer. So of course it would be natural that there's no difference in deaths. You can't even find more cancer. So some screening tests fail that quickly. But most screening tests do find more cancer. That's the first prerequisite. Mammography certainly does. PSA screening certainly does. Lung cancer, CT screening certainly does. Chest x-ray with sputum cytology will save for another day. Colonoscopy, sigmoidoscopy, FOBT. Transvaginal ultrasound and CA-125 for ovarian cancer. You find more cancer. And even MRI of the liver for HCC may find more cancer. So there are lots of things that might find more cancer. But not all of those things do the next important thing reduce disease-specific mortality. It's not just enough to find the cancer. You need to act upon the cancer, interdict on the cancer, do something to prevent the cancer from otherwise killing you. That's what the goal of screening is. It's not just to tell me I have cancer, it's to hopefully cure me of the cancer. So the next thing we want from a screening program is to reduce disease-specific mortality. We're not looking at five-year survival rates. There are many videos that explain why that's a flawed concept. We're looking at age-adjusted mortality rates across a population, or we're looking at the end point of cancer-specific death in a randomized control trial. Now, what you need to know about cancer is that just because the pathologist looks at the microscope and says you have cancer, it doesn't mean it's the type of cancer you want to find by screening. It turns out there's at least three or four different types of cancers, and there's only one type that you really want to find by screening, and it's classically used a barnyard analogy to explain this. So what do I mean by that? Imagine you have a barnyard and you want to keep the animals in the yard and you erect a fence around the barnyard. That's the screening metaphor. And there are some animals in your barnyard that are moving slow, slowly. You didn't need a fence to keep them penned in. For instance, a turtle. A turtle is moving so slowly, might never escape your yard. There's a rabbit in your yard. This is the kind of thing that would have escaped your yard had you not had the fence. But now that you have the fence, you trap it. And that's the kind of cancer we want. We don't want Turtles, which are so slow-growing tumors, they wouldn't have caused mortality or morbidity in your natural life. By finding a turtle, you can only have over-treatment. You can't have any commensurate benefit because it wasn't going to do anything anyway. By catching a rabbit, that was a cancer that was going to kill you, but now that we caught it and removed it, it's not going to kill you, so that's a success. But the third analogy here is a bird. A bird in your yard is going to fly right over the fence whether you have a fence or not. And we often find cancers through screening that we're going to metastasize and kill you no matter what. And in that case, you haven't really had a benefit from screening. You've just moved the diagnosis a little bit sooner and you have lead time. And so you may improve a five-year survival rate without changing the mortality rate we're going to talk about in this talk. So overdiagnosis occurs when screening detected cancers are either non-growing or slow growing so that would never cause medical problems. I actually also think overdiagnosis occurs if you catch too many birds as well. And so every time I hear about Google AI finding more cancer, it's a flawed metric because they're asking how many birds, turtles, and rabbits it's finding and not how many rabbits. We want to find more rabbits, less birds, less turtles. 
So here's CA125. You definitely find more cancer. That's shown on the left in cumulative cases in this randomized control trial called the PLCO, the prostate, lung, ovarian, and colorectal cancer project. I think I switched the C and the O, but you get the picture. You find more cancer shown on the left, a sustained increase in cancer over the years of the study. But in terms of death from that target cancer, ovarian cancer, there's absolutely no lick of difference in the cumulative death on the right. So we don't recommend CA-125 and transvaginal ultrasound as a screening modality in average risk women because of the PLCO study that failed to find a benefit. <clears throat> Many cancer screening programs have reported a disease-specific mortality benefit. Here are some. Maybe in future videos, I'll walk you through my thoughts on all of these. They all have different and conflicting and debatable levels of evidence. But that's not the end of the road. You only want to find and avert a cancer death because presumably that makes you live longer. Living longer is just how many days you live. It's just whether or not you die for any reason. If you didn't have a prostate cancer death but died of the same day of a heart attack, you didn't live any longer. You traded a death. We don't want a cancer screening program to trade deaths. We want to have a sustained increase in survival as a result of eliminating one death but presumably keeping all the other deaths relatively constant. That's the goal. So the goal of cancer screening programs is you got to find more cancer. If you don't, you're not going to be successful. You have to reduce cause-specific or disease-specific mortality. And you've got to improve all-cause mortality. This is the real goal of cancer screening. Some people have asked me since I've been doing this talk, um, what about morbidity? What about quality of life? Can you improve quality of life? I'd say absolutely. A randomized control trial of cancer screening that doesn't show an improvement in mortality but improvement in quality of life would be a winner. The problem is that none of these trials are even designed or suited to measure quality of life accurately over the course of the study. They've never done that, and we have no clue. And you can look at some procedures, but half these trials didn't even capture the procedures very well, and so you wouldn't be getting a reliable metric of quality of life. So that's very speculatory. Historically, of course, we've wanted more than a cancer screening program just improving my quality. We have told people that it, quote unquote, saves lives. And in fact, around mammography, the field of medicine has been particularly paternalistic. The American Cancer Society used to have an advertisement that read, if a woman hasn't had a mammogram, she might need more than her breasts examined, which was a pejorative advertisement meant to suggest that a woman who didn't choose to do a mammogram was somehow crazy or delusional, which is a type of persuasive technique I find deeply unappealing and problematic in the medical profession. So this is the goal of cancer screening. Let's walk through what we know about mammography. Well, we know one thing, I'll tell you right off the bat. <clears throat> we have evidence that it reduces cause-specific death. But I won't be able to muster much evidence that improves all-cause mortality, so it's going to live in this netherworld of many such studies. Now, we wrote an analysis article in the British Medical Journal in 2016 where we entitled it, Why Cancer Screening Has Never Been Shown to Save Lives and What We Can Do About It. We focused primarily on lung cancer, colon cancer, um, prostate cancer, and breast cancer. And we basically said that there really wasn't reliable, randomized control trial evidence that these screening modalities reduced all-cause death. You might reduce the death from the target cancer, like FOBT lowers the risk of death of colon cancer, but you didn't show a reduction in all-cause death. You didn't show that it translated. And the worry is, of course, that there's some off-target effect, an other untoward cause of death that's actually going up a little bit, offsetting your gain, such that you get no net benefit. And you cannot say, you cannot say that doesn't exist until you power your study adequately to show reduction in all-cause mortality. Now, since the writing of our paper, there's been one, I think, flexible sigmoidoscopy in a pooled meta-analytic estimate in the Annals of Internal Medicine that has met this mark, but that's it. NLST, I'm sorry, in the updated publication by Paul Pinsky and JCO, you lost the OM benefit, and it was always spurious. It was always likely to be spurious, as I'd been arguing for years. And, of course, Nelson, you don't even have it. You're not even close. All right, so put lung aside. Put... Put sigmoidoscopy aside, I think that might be the closest we have to a winner. Colonoscopy, it's not looking so hot from, you know, the new Nordic study. But let's just talk about mammograms here. First, I just want to maybe flesh out this concept a little bit. This is the Minnesota Colorectal Cancer Screening Study. It's not mammograms, but it shows this nicely. This is the long-term 30-year follow-up of the study. And what it shows you is in the control group or screening group, there was a huge reduction in deaths from colon cancer. 192 people per 10,000 people died in the control group versus 128. That's a significant reduction. That's why FOBT and now FIT has been recommended so widely. But in the overall mortality, the overall mortality is, is 7,109 and 7,011, basically the same exact number. 
And some people say, well, of course you're going to die of something, but that's flawed here because not only is the aggregate death statistic the same at a single unit in time, the Kaplan-Meier curves are superimposable for the entire journey for all-cause mortality. So it's not that you didn't die of colon cancer, but you died of a heart attack. It's that at every moment in time, the exact same fraction of people are dead at the exact same time. So there's no evidence that anyone's living any longer in this long-term follow-up of a randomized control study. So whatever gain you're getting in colorectal cancer, you do worry that there's some off-target effect, that countervailing effect that's, that's thwarting your net benefit. And we speculate from a wide variety of literature in our paper that there are harms of treatment and harms of overtreatment, and there's even an increased risk of cardiovascular events or suicidality after certain cancer diagnoses. And we don't know if these offset the gains of some of these screening tests, which are very meager, all things considered, to at best. And the purpose of our essay is not to say that we know it doesn't improve survival for sure. We cannot know that. We don't know that. But it's to say that you haven't proven your gains from cause-specific mortality translate into an all-cause mortality benefit. And until you do so, I think it's not fair to tell a person this saves lives. It hasn't been shown to save lives if the Kaplan-Meier survival function is superimposable. It hasn't. It's just been shown to avert one type of cancer death. Now, some people might say, I'll do it anyway, doc. But a lot of people, myself included, would say, what are you even talking about? If you can't improve my survival, leave me alone. And we'll talk about David Sack at the end of this. All right. Now let's get into breast cancer screening. Let's get into mammograms. This was a paper in the Annals of Internal Medicine by Russell Harris, really thoughtful researcher. He said, screening is only part of the answer to breast cancer. Improvements in treatment and staging and diagnosis are also another part of the answer. We're going to look at that a little bit more. And he basically cites something over time. The top of this figure shows some Canadian studies that were conducted between 1980 and 2005 in the relative age groups. It shows the reduction in cause-specific mortality, breast cancer death, not all-cause mortality. It's 1.09, 1.02, 1.05, wide conference interval, but broadly it's null. It's no benefit. It's actually... A lot like masking that conference interval. It's null. It's no benefit. Whereas the earlier USPSTF analyses looking at older studies from the 70s and 80s where treatment was very different than it is today and in many cases barbaric and inferior, those had relative risk mortality reductions of 0 0.68, 0 0.86, 0 0.85. As you can see, and Russell Harris's point is, as time goes on, it appears whatever benefit you're getting from mammographic screening is dissipating. It's getting worse. Now, proponents of mammographic screening say our technology is getting better. 3D mammography, dual tomography, this, that, AI detected, blah, 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 blah. But the truth is there's another secular trend, which is there's a huge improvement in treatment for breast cancer. And the more you improve treatment, the more difficult it will be for screening to show a benefit. Another principle of cancer screening you need to know. The potential for a screening test to show benefit is based on differential health outcomes versus early versus advanced stage. What do I mean? If you have testicle cancer and you catch it early and cut it out, you got a 99% chance of cure. If you have testicle cancer and you find it late when it's spread to the lungs, you have a 96 or 97% chance of cure for many types of testicle cancer. It's very high. There's not much of a difference there. So screening program that finds cancer that will otherwise be found late, early, doesn't really improve outcomes. And actually, self-screening for the testicle exam is USPSTF grade D, don't do it, harms exceed benefit, in part because there's no differential effect to exploit. With breast cancer, historically, you find it early, you catch it, you can cut it out, and maybe you can cure some people. Maybe there's overdiagnosis along the way. But you find it late, and our drugs were dilapidated, antiquated. There were only taxanes and adromycin. It was not so great. But now, as treatment gets better, that treatment differential is getting closed. It actually makes it harder for a screening program to show benefit, much like the testicle cancer example. We're not there yet, but it's a lot harder. So... Okay, here I'm introducing the idea that as time goes on, it's been harder and harder to show benefits even in randomized control trials. By the way, the Canadian study is not exactly recent. It was uh, launched uh, two years before I was born, but so it's, I would consider it old. And we really do, as I'm gonna conclude in this talk, need some updated studies. Now, this is one of my favorite papers, Peter Juni and uh, Marcel Zualen in the Annals of Internal Medicine. It's time to initiate another breast cancer screening trial. Very clever, very clever. Let me tell you what they're doing here. <clears throat> they go through all the randomized control trials for breast cancer screening. And here they plot something called the Z-score for non-breast cancer related death. Now we know cancer screening mammography should lower your risk of dying of breast cancer. That's the goal. Lower your risk of dying of breast cancer. That's the goal. But what it shouldn't do is it shouldn't change your risk of dying of heart attacks or pancreas cancer or strokes or lung cancer after all. 
I hope it's not looking at the pancreas if it is a mammogram, right? It's not supposed to change all these other causes of death. So what they do is they plot the non-breast cancer causes of death in all of the large randomized control trials. And a Z-score of 1.96 or negative 1.96 is broadly considered nominal significance and correlates with a p-value of like 0.05. That's like from the tables and such. And so they're plotting those p-value lines on that, saying that these are looked to appear to be kind of big differences in non-breast cancer related death. And you can see that dots above the line <clears throat> show a harm and dots below the line show a benefit or vice versa. These are things where there is a statistically significant difference in non-breast cancer death. And the trials in the middle, there's not such a difference. And their point is that it's a little fishy that a mammographic trial has these differences in non-breast cancer death. And what they suggest it means, their suggestion, is that these are inadequately randomized control trials, inconsistent or inadequate. They're inconsistent studies. They put those in the bottom. And the consistent trials, the one where there's no real difference in non-breast cancer death, which is what you ought to expect in a randomized trial, because after all, the mammogram's not changing my risk of a heart attack. It shouldn't, neither beneficial or harmful. And people who think radiation has a harm, I mean, come on, we're talking about such small magnitudes here, it's not gonna do anything, let's be honest, come on, put that away. I know there's like one person out there who bangs on that drum endlessly. These are relatively low doses of radiation. Get, get in myocardial perfusion imaging scan, get a CT scan, PE protocol, now you're talking some millisieverts. Okay, you're not talking much here. Okay, <clears throat> if you focus on the consistent studies, look what they find. There is a reduction in breast cancer specific death. This is a forest plot and a pooled estimate. And what it shows you is that it's 0.85 relative risk, including the older studies are doing the driving because Canada one and two, you know, those are pretty null. The newer studies are null to Russell Harris's point. But there is a significant benefit in breast cancer death. If you look at the inconsistent studies, there's a whopper of a benefit. There's an even bigger benefit, maybe an implausibly large benefit. We'll come back to that. If you look at all-cause mortality for the consistent studies, it is 1.00. It is rock-solid null. For the inconsistent studies, it's actually 0.94. It looks like, if anything, trending towards benefit, uh, but of course not significant as well. But their point here is that we really should put more weight on the consistent studies. And we do worry back in the diggity. Let me put it to you this way, because I know there's some people in this space who are quite litigious. Let me put it to you this way. I'll say, I think everyone will agree that as time has gone on, the design and conduct of randomized control trials has gotten better. And there are certainly many randomized control trials from the past, not naming names, that may have gross deficiencies in randomization, may have randomized lots of people without clear uh, documentation of that randomization, may have had subversion of randomization, errors in randomization, and that might translate into difference in outcomes that are outside chance possibility that seem unlikely to be explicated. So if you were to disregard or deprioritize that evidence and prioritize evidence that looks like it's more adequately randomized, one might yield a different conclusion, generally speaking. And here, according to Peter Juni, there ain't no all-cause mortality difference. There is only a very modest breast cancer reduction difference if you look at the adequately randomized trials. So already mammography is losing some ground here. Let me just show you one example. This is the Canadian Breast Cancer Screening Study, the, the last big one that was published. And basically, you know, complex algorithm and includes some breast examination. Critics say that that breast examination is the reason why the results were null. Well, if the breast examination is so damn good that it can nullify your results, then why the hell are you doing mammograms anyway? Just do a breast exam. But by the way, the Shanghai study also kind of contradicts that claim. But, you know, you'll have to explain that to me. This is a clinical breast exam, not a self-breast exam. So they think it's better. But anyway, this is a whole side arm of dialogue. Here's the results. All cause survival. You can only see one line because the curves are superimposable. Breast cancer specific death. There's one line, the curves are superimposable. There ain't no lick of difference in breast cancer specific death or all cause mortality, which is what we care about. And this is really rather sobering. I always say the old saying in oncology is if you can fit a laser pointer between the curves, you can give the plenary session. You can't do that here. Mammography is not doing anything in this clinical study. This is a large, well done, modern, relatively, randomized control trial. This is um, uh, uh, Karsten Jorgensen and Peter Gocha, and I probably mispronounced that, I apologize to both of you. Um, <laughs> this is the Cochrane Review from 2013, and they define, they break out the trials a little bit differently but some similarity, adequately randomized and suboptimally randomized control trials. They have their reasons for why they're prioritizing some evidence. And if you look at breast cancer mortality and adequately randomized trials, you get a point estimate for breast cancer death. That is null, 0 0.9, 0 0.79 to 1.02. There's no difference there. For the suboptimally randomized trials, there is a difference. Um, but again, they have reasons why they deprioritize that evidence that you can read in the Cochrane Report. 
And by the way, their update is coming soon, I hear from the, from the Danish writers. But overall mortality, what people actually care about. I mean, I'm a healthy person. Yes, I care about dying of pancreas cancer or breast cancer or colon cancer. I don't want to die of those things. But on the whole, I want to live longer. Well, if I go to this mammographic screening all these years, compliant in a study, do I live longer? And in adequately randomized trials, there ain't no suggestion you live longer, nor in suboptimally randomized trials. And if you look at women in their 40, there's so few events, it's just totally noise. And they have those forest plots you can look at in the paper. So now we're getting the picture that mammographic screening you know, really justified by very, very old studies. Many of the studies have an imbalance in non-breast cancer death outside of uh, nominally significant Z-scores that looks a little bit odd. When that, ev that evidence is somehow better than the rest of the evidence, that's a little weird. And when you start to pool the best evidence and look at the endpoints people care about, you find little to no difference. Healthy people undergoing a screening practice, little to no difference. We'll come back to this. Ah, abolishing the mammographic screening programs, a view from the Swiss Medical Board. This is by Peter Juni and colleagues. And what this shows you rather clearly is that the perception of mammographic screening and the reality of mammographic screening are fundamentally different. On the top figure, they're asking women, what do you think happens when you get mammographic screening? And they say, I don't know. I think like with, that, with screening, 881 women would be fine. 80 would die of breast cancer and 39 women would die of other causes. Uh, with screening, but without screening, it would be like 800 and women are alive and 160 die of breast cancer and 39 die of other causes. So like getting your mammogram is a huge benefit. That's what women think. On the bottom panel, it shows you the reality, which is without with screening, 956 or 957 people die, four die of breast cancer, 39 or 40 die of other reasons. And with screening, it's 956 die, five die of breast cancer, 39 die from other causes. And here it's 39 or 40 or 39 because they don't have an all-cause mortality benefit. Put another way, that yellow bar, that orange box, not yellow bar, orange box is showing you the difference between perception that breast cancer is this horrible risk to women and reality that it's one of the many reasons women die of and that screening actually we don't really know if it makes much of a difference in all-cause mortality. And so the Swiss Medical Board, when they see something like this and show this to women, it's going to change the way people consent to this practice. And in fact, if you didn't incentivize doctors to do this, I think, and you had a really good informed consent like this video, people would choose differently. All right, now we're getting into the population data, data, which I think builds more of a circumstantial case around this. This is Archie Blyer and Gil Welsh. Um, this was the first of, I think, two important Welsh papers on this topic in the New England Journal. This is looking at, you know, three decades of screening of mammography on breast cancer incidents um, for early and late stage. And the idea is simple. If you don't do anything to women over time, you wouldn't expect much differences. And in fact, you don't see much differences for women younger than 40 in early stage breast cancer, catching it when it's just isolated to the breast, or late stage breast cancer when it's spread to the nodes or to distant sites. There's not much difference over time. This is the breast cancer incidence per 100,000 women over time. And again, there's no new carcinogen being put in the water supply. I mean, it's pretty stable. That's their point. But let's look at women who are subject to mammographic screening, okay, 40 and older. In the top bar, they're showing you that the rates of mammograms really exploded in the late 1980s based on this sort of fear campaigns and this sort of paternalistic sort of propaganda kind of style. They increased mammographic screening rates. And look what happened to early stage cancer. It exploded in incidents. I mean, we went from, you know, in the hundreds to the 200s of incidents of, breast, of early stage breast cancer. But because we did that, surely we're catching cancer early and cutting it out. And so we're preventing late stage disease. But look at late stage cancer. It's barely changed, if at all. It's gone down a little bit. Maybe we've had some gains, but barely at all. So we're finding so many more tumors, but we're not seeing a commensurate decline in advanced stage cancer, which is the sine qua non, the hallmark of overdiagnosis. It looks like it's rampant overdiagnosis. You're just medicalizing people without really having a commensurate benefit. And in fact, if you look at late stage disease, regional disease and distant disease, if anything, the case is stronger. The rate of incident distant cancer over time is just rock solid over time. We're not really averting these things with, you know, heavy handed screening programs are not really changing distant disease rates, incidents over time. All right, Welsh is back with a few of his colleagues, including my old boss and friend, Mayor Barry Kramer, and they have breast cancer tumor size overdiagnosis and mammographic screening effectiveness. This is their other New England Journal paper. And what it shows you is the incidence of breast cancer over time, metastatic, and it's just rock solid. You would have expected all this increase in early diagnosis would lower the incident rate of metastatic breast cancer sometime later. And yet you don't see that. 
you're diagnosing all this breast cancer, cutting out all these tumors, and you have, you're not budging the metastatic breast cancer incident rate. We have a 30% increase since the onset of screening mammography in early cancer, in all invasive cancers, but no difference in breast cancers. All invasive means it's invaded the basement membrane, but it's often early. It's like localized to the breast, some terms. And here's the real kicker of the paper and also some of the disputed figures. I will leave that to you to read about. Okay, here's the kicker. Once mammographic screening was introduced in these years, you see an uptick in diagnosing some tumors, one to two centimeter tumors. Makes sense. You're finding smaller things. It's mammogram. It's better than anything else, right? It's finding tumor. And you find a lot more in situ. That's that dotted blue line going up. And less than one centimeter is that blue line. It's exploding. You never were finding less than one centimeter. Now you're finding less than one centimeter. But what about two, three, and five centimeter tumors? If you're finding more smaller tumors, you should be finding less bigger tumors. You should be finding them when they're small and preventing them from getting big. But what about bigger tumors? They're absolutely unchanged. Two is pretty flat, three is pretty fat, and five is just totally flat. So we're screening and screening and screening people. We have a huge explosion in breast cancer survivors and diagnosis of breast cancer. We don't see a commensurate decline in advanced disease or distant disease. We don't see a decline in incident of metastatic disease. And we don't see a decline in bigger tumors. We see a huge explosion in small tumors, but no commensurate decline in bigger tumors. So are we, are we really catching the cancers? Are we really catching the rabbits? Or are we just catching turtles? Because if you caught a rabbit, you're not going to get to that fence. They were not, you know, not going to go too far, but we're not catching. It doesn't appear to be that we're catching a lot of rabbits. And here they show the difference in survival rates, deaths from breast cancer based on the initial tumor diagnosis uh, by size. And what they show you is absolutely you get an improvement in the small tumor size survival rates, which is both the product of lead time bias and better treatment. But the bigger tumors are also getting a huge reduction in a huge improvement in survival, a relative risk reduction that's large in survival. Now, why are they doing that? They're getting that because it cannot be explained by mammography. It's got to be largely explained by improved treatment. Why? Because we're not finding, you know, there's no change in the rate with which these tumors are being detected over time. Whereas the smaller tumors are getting both a lower case fatality rate because of lead time, length time, and overdiagnosis bias, and also better treatment, I think. They're giving a little bit of both. All right, so putting this final, final nails in this coffin, I mean, what have we talked about so far? You know, we've talked about dubious old studies, you know, old studies that don't reflect contemporary medical practice. If anything, they exaggerated benefits. Modern studies have less benefits. Suboptimally randomized trials have bigger benefits than optimally randomized studies. Optimally randomized studies have disputable or no benefit in breast cancer specific death, let alone all cause mortality benefits. We talk about an explosion of early diagnosis. We talk about no change in uh, the detection of large tumors despite an explosion in finding more small tumors. Um, these are all, uh, uh, we're painting a picture here. And what is the most parsimonious explanation? That this is some miracle screening test or that we have perhaps deployed one of the most ineffective and foolhardy campaigns bolstered by egos and, and conf conflicts of interest that justify this juggernaut. And one of those reasons is this paper, that people who undergo this process, who have it done to them, they feel as if their life is saved. I mean, if I get in a car accident and they scan me, I find a kidney cancer, you cut it out, I'll be like, thank God I got in a car accident, I found my kidney cancer, cut it out before it did something bad. But what if the counterfactual was I didn't get in that car accident, you didn't do the scan, and I didn't find the cancer, but then I lived the rest of my life and then I died on an autopsy, there was a little kidney cancer there, didn't do anything. That's a different counterfactual than the one I tell myself. We tell ourselves that we're the protagonist of all our stories and all the things that happened to us made us better for it. You know, this is the universal way in which human beings cope in the world. So a woman who had a breast cancer found by mammography often feels as if it saved her life. But what was the real probability that it did save her life? And Gil Welsh and Brittany Frankel tried to tackle that in this Jam I Am paper. And here, for the sake of this paper, they're using an optimistic scenario. They're going to say mammography improves breast cancer death by 20%, even though statistically I don't know that to be true. But even with that optimistic assumption, let's see what they get. We found that a 50-year-old woman, the estimated risk of having a screening detected breast cancer in the next 10 years is 100 and, uh, 1,910 per 100,000. Her observed 20-year risk of breast cancer is 990 per 100,000. Assuming that mammography reduced this risk by 20%, the risk of death in the absence of screening was 1,200, which suggests a mortality benefit accrued to 250 per 100,000. Thus, the probability that a woman with screening detected breast cancer avoids a breast cancer death because of mammography assuming it works, which is a bizarre, which is a strong assumption, is 13%. This number falls to 3% if screening mammography reduces breast cancer mortality by just 5%. And all probability estimates are less than 25%. What's his point? If you have had a cancer found by mammography 
and you feel like it saved your life, even with the most favorable assumptions in the system to date, much more likely it didn't and you were subject to incidental finding. Most women with screening detected breast cancer have not had their life saved by screening. They're instead either diagnosed early with no effect on their mortality or overdiagnosed. All right. I wrote a paper, of course, the last iteration of the USPSTF guidelines on mammographic screening, where I say how they ought to be interpreted. And what I say is that they ought to be interpreted not that you have to do this or that you should be incentivized to do what they say, but that you could choose to do it, but also choose to decline it. And I think that's how it ought to be recommended. And I lament and curse healthcare systems that don't give practitioners that flexibility. I still believe this is right. Now let's talk about David Sackett. Who is this person? It's David Sackett, obviously. Well, I'm sure two people knew who this was, but this is David Sackett, the father of evidence-based medicine. Preventive medicine displays three elements of arrogance. First, it is aggressively assertive, pursuing symptomless individuals and telling them what they must do to remain healthy. Occasionally, it invokes the force of law, like vaccine mandates, and this time they, they screwed that up, didn't they, with the COVID? Second, seatbelts, I think, do work, okay. Second, preventive medicine is presumptuous, confident that the interventions it espouses will, on average, do more harm, do more good than harm to those who accept and adhere to them. We're presumptuous. We're so confident that mammography is good. Finally, preventive medicine is overbearing, attacking those who question the value of the recommendations. Let's see how this video fares. I'm sure there'll be some attacks, attacks, attacks. This is David Sackett. This is written decades ago. He's so right. The fundamental promise we make when we actively solicit individuals and exhort them to accept preventive interventions must be that, on average, they will be better for it. It must be that. You must know they're on average better for that. You can't just do it because you feel like in your gut when all the evidence staring you in your face is that this is not doing much, if anything at all. Accordingly, we must have the highest evidence, randomized evidence, that our preventive maneuver will, in fact, do more good than harm. We must have that. Without evidence from positive randomized trials and better still, systematic reviews of randomized trials, we cannot justify soliciting the well to accept any personal health intervention. He would have been against the booster mandates in college kids. He would have been against mammography were he here today. There are simply too many examples of the disastrous inadequacy of lesser evidence as the basis for inter individual interventions among the well. Supplemental oxygen for preemies causing retinal fibroplasia, healthy babies sleeping face down causing SIDS, thymic irradiation to healthy children, the list goes on and on. When you don't know for sure and you intervene on healthy people, you can bungle it catastrophically and poison trust for a generation. This is David Sackett. I place the blame directly on the medical experts who, to gain private profit from their industry affiliations to satisfy a narcissistic need for public acclaim or in a misguided attempt to do good, advocate preventive maneuvers that have never been validated in randomized trials. Not only do they abuse their positions by advocating unproven preventives, they also stifle dissent. Others who would know better than to promote preventive maneuvers without clinical trials evidence are simply wrongheaded in their view. Experts refuse to learn from history until they make it themselves, and the price for their arrogance is paid by the innocent. Preventive medicine is too important to be led by them. That's good stuff, man. That's good stuff. So mammography, my conclusions, okay, it doesn't save lives. Where's your all-cause mortality benefit? And by the way, if you really were to do the study that I'm about to ask you for next and power it for that, and you need to get 3 million women in each arm, how big is the benefit? This is the point Mandrola makes. Is it even worth pursuing at a population level? We need to replicate the basic randomized control trials, though I do think I'd rather have it done than not done because I don't want to live for another 50 years of debate. Just replicate it. Run the $6 million, six million person study. It should be fine. Actually, I have a power calc. I think it'll come to 2.4 million. It's going to be lower than 6 mil in my paper called Powering Cancer Screening for Overall Mortality. It's better to settle this in the next 20 years than let it go on for another 100 years. But gains in treatment, breast cancer treatment is so much better. Better surgery, better diagnosis, better diagnostic imaging, not screening imaging, diagnostic imaging, better drugs, better adjuvant treatment, better dosing of adjuvant treatment, better HER2-directed therapy, better extended adjuvant treatments. All this is eroding the benefit of screening. And the benefit of screening wasn't that great in the 1980s. And it was a little bit better in the 1960s, but when you start to ignore a little bit oddball studies with uh, discrepancies in non-breast cancer-related death, it gets to be a little bit smaller. Uh, but it's never been great. Everything should be powered for overall mortality. You can't tell someone they live longer. You can't say you save their life if you have something that in randomized studies have never shown improvement in overall survival. We've got to improve upon that. So 
the USPSTF this week has once again gone to the 40-year-old women and said, you know, you should do this. I think it's grade B in their draft recommendation every other year. And then they keep saying that black women have a higher risk of worse outcomes, which is absolutely true. But it doesn't follow that they benefit disproportionately from the intervention. Where is the evidence showing that routine mammographic screening has a bigger absolute risk reduction and a bigger breast cancer-related death and a bigger all-cause mortality-related death benefit in African-American women? Where is, that be- where is that data? Yes, some groups of people do worse than other groups of people, but it doesn't mean that they benefit from more screening. You have to show they benefit from more screening. You need to stop rehashing this USPSTF. This is all old data. These recommendations are old. We don't need to reiterate on on this old data. What we need are new studies. I would love to see the USPSTF issue two guidelines. This is what people who want it, maximalists want to do and what minimalists want to do. This is what people with one personality type would want. This is what people with others. Not this blanket recommendation. I also think they should say, these are the three studies that we would want to reduce uncertainty. But they don't do that. They just keep going making these recommendations. And they're like, of course, in line with the American College of Radiology. Well, you know what? Of course, people who are making a lot of money from running these programs are going to want to do them. And it's not just the money. It's not that they're in it for the money. I'm sure they're in it for the right reason, but it's their life's meaning. They have purpose from it. I mean, it gives them something to do. Um, And I think David Sackett is onto that. It's both a financial conflict and an ideological conflict. When I look at this data, by the way, I remember when I went to medical school, I was a big believer as a, as a lay person that mammographic screening must be great because obviously it's being recommended so widely. The first time I read, uh, the, I think it was the Lancet Moss paper, 2004-ish, I, if somebody wants to check that. The, I read that paper for, I think, Adam Sifu's class. And it was like somebody punched me in the stomach. I was like, oh my God, this is terrible. The data is so much weaker than I thought. And then the more I dug into it, it was just weaker, weaker, weaker. I read all these studies, weak, weak, weak. I read Peter Goetje's book. Weak and devastating, read Truth, Lies, and Controversy by Goethe. Um, I read Gil Welch's books, multiple. You know, you read all that, and you, the conclusion is, like, it's just can't, it's not that great. And, you know, if we're going to do it, we should be honest. Like, we don't know it improves all-cause mortality. It might, in some studies, reduce the risk of dying of breast cancer, but probably the better study says it doesn't do much there. If you find a breast cancer, there's this huge overdiagnosis problem, and we don't know what to do with that. We cannot, under the microscope, differentiate rabbits from birds from turtles, and so overdiagnosis will plague us. And uh, we still don't know a lot about this. It is a type of arrogance. Yes, dying of breast cancer is horrible, and nobody wants anyone to die of breast cancer. We just don't know if this is the solution, and we should be honest about that. And it should be okay to say no. So on that note, you like this video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message. Send the video to a friend or colleague. Tweet it. Post it. I'll be back next time.